In today's episode of Throttle Stop Garage, we're going to have a look and see if we can improve this import shrinker and stretcher set. Stay tuned. Okay, so if you're like me, you've bought a set of these shrinkers and stretchers, they're an import knockoff. Uh, they're all made in the same factory as far as we know. I purchased this set from Eastwood many, many years ago, probably a decade ago. I've had them in the shop. They work okay, but one of them works pretty well, which is the stretcher. The other one, the shrinker, has never really worked very well at all. So in this episode, we're going to have a look at how these things work and whether or not we can fix them. So after using these for about 10 years, I've decided it's time to upgrade the jaws. I've never been really happy with them. In fact, right out of the box, they barely even worked. I had to spend sort of half a day tuning them up. If that's the case with yours, uh, this may be the video for you. So what I've done, or what we will do today, is we're gonna take the shrinker and stretcher and we're gonna upgrade the jaws. So I bought, again, no sponsorship on this channel. I bought the, a jaw upgrade set for, these are copies of a Lancaster shrinker. So I'm gonna take a leap of faith here and I'm gonna imagine that this is gonna work. But these are a stipple finished jaw that's been sold to me by TM Technologies. So that's the guys that do uh, great work with sheet metal. Uh, they sold them to me. They even checked back with me to make sure that I was uh, about to do the right thing. So I do appreciate that, um, you know, you're dealing with people when you buy some of this stuff instead of, you know, the giant corporations that sell you this garbage. So I'm hoping these work. And you know what? If they don't work, I'm going to make them work because uh, that's just the way I roll. So I'm going to show you how the other ones work, first of all. And then we're going to take a look at what the upgrades might look like. So the jaws in these crazy things are really not that big a deal. But you can see what they're meant to do. So this is obviously the stretcher. So clamp down, hold material, and then pull it apart. Now you can see, even when I'm trying to operate it by hand, hopefully you can see, that the stretch between the top and the bottom jaw is different. So that's, uh, I guess that's adding curvature, right? If you stretch that that way. And the biggest problem with them is the linear scoring that's on the jaws leaves a mark on the material. That's like this, and it's sort of hard to remove, right? So it leaves that sort of finished. No big deal, but again, if you're trying to up your metal shaping game as I am, then this is got creating extra problems for you that you probably don't need. So I'm hoping that with a little bit of upgrade, we'll be able to get these to work properly. Again, these are the standard jaws that come with uh, these uh, pieces of equipment. So they're a serrated jaw that just tend to leave a lot of marking on your material. And I've also purchased a set of stippled jaws, which I hope are going to work better, right? So the idea with the stippling jaws is that they're just going to leave a very light texture on the metal instead of the big gouges, probably more suited for aluminum, uh, but I know they also work in steel. And it leaves a mark that they say looks like 180 grit sandpaper. So this would be preferred for most metal, especially if you were if you're doing anything in aluminum, then this sort of um, this sort of marking on the material is stress risers and just ugly and it's gonna take a lot of polishing out. I guess on steel it's not as big a deal. I've used again, I've used these for over a decade. Okay, so first let's clean them up. Let's get ready to put the fancy parts on, and we'll then see how it all works. Okay, full disclosure, I know you're supposed to take these apart after every use and clean them. I never do that. I don't imagine anyone actually does. Uh, but you can see I've had a little bit of fun with some aluminum over the, over time, and it actually embeds right in the jaw. The jaw will rip the aluminum apart. So I needed to get in with a dental pick and pull it out, and then I, uh, I needed to clean everything up. I've never had them fully apart. This is the first time. So I get the jaws all cleaned up, get them put back together, and while I'm replacing the jaws, I thought, well, you know, you might as well keep the old stuff and try to try to get it sort of tidied up and make it as good as you can. Uh, so just a little steel brush, tidy them up in a bin of Varsol, and then pull the rest of it apart. Didn't take too long, a couple of snap rings here and there, and then you start discovering, wow, these really are not very precisely made machines. You get it all pulled apart, and no horrors, nothing weird. Nothing wacky on the inside. The fit of everything is kind of garbagey, but yeah, it's all the same. And here's the first problem. I found that that bottom area where the jaws attach is not square. Well, what are you gonna do? 
So off to the vice I go, and I tried to square it up with just a file at first. It was really well out of square, causing that bottom jaw to rock every single time that I pushed down on that jaw set, right? So it would just rock against that until it sort of established its own level. That was never going to be good enough. And that powder coat was just garbage. I peeled it off with a razor blade eventually. No, well, there we are. I think what we learned is that I can't lap these things when you guys are in the way. <laughs> yeah, I was having a heck of a time because I was I kept getting a high spot and it was because I was working around the camera. Anyway, so now we're lapped. Um, so I've got the two blocks over here and I've got uh, some dicom on them. Just a high spot machinist blue. And then when I set the part down, give it a wiggle. And then you can see the pattern. So it's not perfect. So I have some low spots in the corners where I was filing there, but that's 80% of the area covered. And now instead of rocking, when this is pushed on, again, the idea here is to stretch the metal, right? Push it apart. Then you're not, you know, having this part rock all over the place. Okay, so with that, we're gonna do the other one the same way. It takes a little bit of time. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. Probably. Anyway, if they were made with any care in the first instance, this would be a lot easier. They're of course not made with any care. The powder coat peels off pretty easily because it was applied over top of rust. So anyway, we'll carry on. We'll get her finished up and show you when we're done both of them now. So for the stretcher, it wasn't too hard to clean this one up. Again, this was the machine that always did seem to sort of work. So um, just fitting it in. Now you can see that when I push down just there, you can see the jaws are opening up at the same rate. So the timing of the jaws was great. And I'm pretty sure that's just getting that bottom foot area squared up. Uh, I put it all back together and I didn't even need to do anything with the stippled jaws to get them to fit. Again, this, this machine had... I don't know, maybe luck of the draw or something. This one kind of worked right out of the box. So set the new jaws in place. Don't forget to leave that card in there. Again, the stippling is pretty easy to chip off if you're not careful. And I set it all up, um, put the jaws back together, fitted it all in. And you know what? It worked. I mean, it's not as aggressive as the, as the straight jaws, but it did work. Okay, so we're just getting going. I thought I would show you what happens when the dies don't fit very well. All right, so this smaller uh, die over here, you can see it's chipped out all along this edge. Identical problem on the reciprocal die, so the one that's facing the other direction, right? And how does that happen? Well, let's just investigate. So as these two are coming together, again, the spring is holding it apart, right? And then they're being driven together. So when I first got these, it was the shrink die that didn't work very well. It's still not perfect, but you can see right there that as they're sitting in the V, there's a little bit of a gap between them here. Now, when I was fixing this the first time, I ground the dies here and here to get them to lap more easily into the V because that was the problem, right? And I was chipping, obviously, chipping these off. Now, the new dies also fit. Again, the fit is, is good. The gap is way worse. So this will quickly destroy this set of dies if you don't do the adjustment. So you can see the, the gap here so when that gap, when you're shrinking the metal and you're, you're pinching it together, you're loading, and then this is rocking, okay? So just based on their relative size and where they are, they should be about equal on the ramp as you're pushing them in, but this one's gonna tend to rock, right? It's gonna tend to come in here, and then you're lots of force right here on the edge, and then tink, and you just break those edges off. Now, if we take a... A quick look, I don't do that, at the dies themselves. So if I put it up against a flat surface, so we'll use the die itself, you can see that they're, they fit together nicely. This is the new set that I bought. So those fit together really well. And we can even, and I've just put some tape on there for 
protection. You can see they're perfectly square. Both are the same. All right, so both are perfectly square. Okay, so that's really nice. Um, the old ones, they're also reasonably square. All right, both are the same. I mean, I did do some work on these. Like I said, I was able to get it to work. But I was grinding on this back, this back side. And I'm sure I watched a YouTube video about that. Um, no idea when or where. This would have been a decade ago when YouTube was young. Anyway, so now what I've got to do is instead of grinding, you know, instead of taking that option and grinding the dies to fit the, the V, I'm, I'm going to take the V and make it fit the dies because there's the dies are accurately made. The dies could be a replacement part. There's no reason why when these things are cut that they wouldn't be perpendicular when they're machined, right? Um, so I'm now going to fix these up. So I'm going to fix the V so that it matches the the dies, right? So we'll get that out and we'll get that done. It probably will take a lot less than it looks. Again, everything is getting magnified here uh, just because of the angles, right? Whenever you've got angles like this, you always think you have to like grind a whole ton off or something and you, you never do. So we're going to look at uh, making these just as perfect as we can get them. We have to do it all by hand, I'm afraid. Um, go, no machines in the shop here that can do this kind of work. Uh, if I was in a real machine shop, I'd be able to say set those up on a on a grinder and then uh, buzz them off right you very accurately set the angle uh, that you need just by measuring what these angles are and then just lapping them in from there okay so we don't have any of that garbage here just working in our garage so we'll see if we can get that uh, a whole lot better without too much time all right away we go oh by the way the bottom one's the ones that that's threaded right that's the one that we lapped here to the bottom and then you can see how this all went in, right? We've nicely rounded off all the corners. Again, the action doesn't really change. Um, it's the longevity of the tool, right? This should just last a little bit longer. All right, let's uh, stop talking, get going on the lapping. Okay, so to get this all set up, first I need to just figure out which sides, you know, where's the highs, where's the lows. So a little bit of that machinist high spot blue comes in and then the big Sharpie marker. So I'm, I'm just marking up the, the die face with the Sharpie and then just taking off the Sharpie mark. That's all it's coming off. Not a whole lot more than that. Just enough to take that off. And then we go uh, over to the, the eight inch grinder, knock that edge off, and then I run it outside, cool it in the snow and then uh, bring it back in and see how it fits. Okay, so that's the grinding done, and we've just taken uh, the same sort of Persian blue or high spot blue, right? And we've got pretty good pattern all the way across, right? Just slide those in, just seeing where they're contacting. Uh, I'm going to let that roll as good enough for this stuff, given that it's the nature of the machine. It floats a little, right? So we're not it exactly has to be perfect, but that's good enough. So now we'll just wipe this garbage off and uh, hopefully no one's yelling in the comments about me grinding this stuff. <laughs> it's all hardened steel. So when you, when you slide it, it's, it's, it's very tough. It's actually reasonably easy to do. Uh, I mean, a little bit of hand skills will get you home. And that's just a fine wheel on my eight inch grinder. And it leaves, you can see the finish that it's leaving on that. There's no real need. I mean, you could throw a stone on it if you wanted to and, and touch it up and polish it even further. I don't believe that in this case that's necessary. That's a really nice finish. Uh, a little bit of uh, lubrication on here just to help things out, but just the littlest bit. Like literally I wipe it on my finger and just wipe it off because again, it's it gets dusty and dirty in your shop. You can hear my furnace going. Uh, things aren't perfect here, so you got to do what you can to see how it all works out. Okay, so we're just going to clean this mess up and then get it all installed back into, uh, into the holder and then we're done. Oh, and both were the same, by the way, right? So that's for the other die set. So 
So now we're just going to put it all back together, test it out. So just throw it back together, put the dies in, and still doesn't work. Look, I'm just even on it there to try to get this to do anything. So after spending the better part of a day messing around with this, I just got frustrated and thought, right, well, I'll just pull all the innards out and have a look at what's going on. I always knew that the one pivot just seemed to not be quite in the right location because the handle would be three quarters of the way down before anything would actually happen. So I start in and I measure everything up as carefully as I could. I try to work out what the details are and how this stupid thing works. There's no reason it shouldn't work at this point. All right, so at this point, we're going to call Uncle on it and just figure out what's wrong. So this video is going to go from how we can upgrade our cheap import shrinker and stretcher set into why shrinker and stretcher sets don't work. Uh, again, as with everything on the channel, not too sure where these things end up. I'm just trying to up my game in terms of uh, machinery and understanding. And this is garbage. Okay, so let's go over it. I've taken the inner workings apart for no other reason than they were inconsistent and they shouldn't be consistent. This is a machine, it's a simple machine, so we can work out the details and, and figure out why it wasn't working. So the stretcher was working fine. It seemed to be okay. And the shrinker wasn't really working very well at all. We saw that in the video footage, didn't really matter what I did. In fact, I've probably destroyed the fancy set of jaws that I put in it, um, just trying to play around with it. And I noticed that they're different. This the 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 shrinker is uh, always not worked, and the stretcher is always kind of worked. You know, okay. And I've heard this from many people who have these things. So uh, no doubt, again, they're rolling off the same factory. So then you stop and you go, okay, what's the same? What's different? So if I take the pins, I've inserted the pins into the one here into the shrinker, right? So they've pushed through and they register perfectly in the pins on the stretcher. Okay, so they're, they're in the same place, right? That's, that's not a problem. Now, somebody might say, well, you did all that work on the front of the jaws. That's not much more than the paint thickness has come off of there. I squared them up, but they're, in fact, almost identical. If anything, well, the stretcher's probably a touch higher, but like a fingernail's worth, not much. Wouldn't matter in terms of how it functions. Then somebody might say, well, you know, you went and, and polished up the ends of these things. I would have you note that, just, just to stop the arguments, you can still see the original uh, blackening on the, uh, the so the, um, the, uh, uh, the oxide finish that's on this stuff. You can still see it there. You can still see it here. I've not done anything else more than just create a smoother bearing surface. This didn't change anything. The running surface is still identical to what it was. I didn't do anything here other than clean the burr off of it. It's not ground. Like it's not been ground till it's smaller. In fact, again, you can still see the original markings through it. So we're talking about tenths of a thou. We're not talking about quarters of an inch. Um, same with the other sets of jaws. Right, so you can see, you can still see through the little bits of black that are showing through there. So I've not gone too far with this. I just went as far as I thought was needed and no further because I know the nature of this stuff. Again, not my first rodeo in terms of fixing machines. So how come one works and the other one doesn't work? Let's go over the basic mechanics. If I put the, uh, if I put the shaft on, right? The massive shaft, then I get uh, 12 inches to the first pivot and so we go 12 inches to the first pivot so there's 12 inches over here and there's there's one inch there okay so it's a 12 to 1 ratio and then we go through to the second pivot which is shorter okay and then I've written uh, marked the numbers down uh, and we've got about well, and this is a variable at this point. Uh, let's call it two and a quarter and one and a quarter here. So what that means is if I'm pushing down here with 100 pounds, which I was using quite a bit more force than that, but let's go with that for now. Then the 12 to one means this coming up with 1200 pounds 
then this particular ratio here is about 1.8, right? So then that's going to be going up with 1,200 pounds, the same 1,200 pounds, which means it's going to be coming down with a force of, you know, 20. Of course, the furnace has to start now. So it's like 2160, if the math is correct, 2160. So we have 2,160 pounds or enough to make a pretty significant dent. I mean, this is just a piece of uh, 1 8 um, hot rolled, right? But I tried to shim it to, you know, wondering where the problem was. It wasn't there. It was enough to dent that against a flat surface. So that's a significant force uh, in order to get that to work. Here's the furnace. Okay, so just to show this a little better, we're gonna take it off the plywood because uh, that was just to help me visualize this. Uh, this will actually help us a little bit more. So we'll throw the pins into things, just slide them in uh, through to where they're machined to fit. And I think this will help us understand this a little better. Okay, so with the, again, with the spring that's inside pulling down, right, that's meant to sit this way. And then this rocks over, so it's it's basically operating on a cam, right? And that takes away the simple math over here, okay? So in fact, what's happening here is if we calculate the radius, we have to calculate the radius of this, uh, of, of this arm, okay? And then as to where it moves, it's also translating down Right, so it's moving away from the fulcrum point. It's moving away as it moves um, by whatever the length of that radius is. Again, I'm not gonna do the math for this because really <laughs> that's what's going on physically. Uh, but I think that's probably gonna get pretty nerdy and pretty boring for a lot of people. But uh, rest assured what's happening here is this would be the most force that you could apply. So at that point, right, if the cam is sitting in this position here, this distance is the shortest, so you still got your 12 inches coming this way, but instead of having one inch, now one inch is out to this end of the pivot, so instead of having that one inch out to the end of the pivot, you've got a half an inch over here. So instead of getting that initial 1,200 pounds, you have 2,400 pounds. So you have 2,400 pounds here that's then getting magnified out uh, by that other ratio, by the 1.8, out to the end. Okay, so it's going to be you know, again, it's going to be twice what we had before. So it'll be four, over 4,000 pounds at the tip if you just put 100 pounds over here, which is fine. That's great. So that's moving. But as we go along that length, this lever here is increasing. So you're getting decreasing force. And it's not insignificant when the, mo when the arm is this short. Okay, so it's not insignificant. So at that point here, what's happening is once we're here, we, we can see both of these machines rocking. Right? And when they're rocking, right at the, the start, you can actually watch the pin pivot move because it's now pushing it more or less straight up. It's no longer operating on that cam. It's operating on the point, so it's a tip load here, and it's pushing it's pushing this up and hopefully not sliding off and doing anything stupid. So on the shrinker, it's getting pretty close to doing something stupid. On the stretcher, we seem to always be on the cam, although I would like it if it operated a little better because you can see here, it would be nice if the distance, right, between where the tip is being applied and the blocks are doing the work, it'd be nice if that distance wasn't so far. So in, in other words, you didn't have to move the arm as far before the tips would engage. That would actually help things a little bit because you'd be able to generate more force at the tip which is what you're trying to do in either a shrinking or a stretching operation, right? You're trying to make the jaws do work. The only way to do those work is to apply force. Okay, so it's turning into a physics lecture. I'm sorry, but not sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's the way this work goes. Okay, so then um, this one here, again, this one works kind of okay, and we can sort of see why. Now, I'm not going to change anything. We've already established that the shrinker and the stretcher bodies are identical, but these jaw parts are not, and that's the problem. <laughs> Right? Uh, of course, there had to be a problem. I just wanted to find the problem. Now I know where the problem is, I can sleep. Um, if you're like me, this is the way the world works, which is unfortunate. Now these two, uh, they don't operate the same way. Okay, so if we have a look, and it's hard to see, it's hard to video this stuff, it's hard to see this stuff, 
but you can actually get like in this case I can get the ruler in between the two like no problem and just roll it on by so you're thinking okay well what's the deal so the problem isn't where the force gets applied the problem because that's controlled by the geometries the problem is this length isn't right okay so and it's just a hair different so let's put the parts together Lucky I can tell them apart, but you can see, you know, inconsistency in, in the manufacturer is a problem here. I need to get it off the, the tip. Let's just take the pin out of there. Okay, so we're okay here. This groove is, for all intents and purposes, well, it's not quite in the same place, so it's not perfect. But I think you can see this back corner. It's not even close, right? All right, so this part is longer than this part. All right, so it needs to grow. It was probably just ground a little bit too uh, heavily at the factory, All right? So that's the first problem. You're thinking, oh, you can't possibly have more than one problem. What are you talking about? More than one problem exists in these parts, I am afraid. The second problem is this. When I put these two things together, the holes, It's just little things, right? Error doesn't cancel out in mechanical things. Error just grows. So there you go. I can't get my ruler to slide across there for love nor money. Like, it's again, they're just a little bit out. If I line them up, you can see, you can even watch the one fall. And you go, okay, well, which way did that error move things? Well, unfortunately in the wrong direction, it's just a little bit. Like if I line them up there and I look through the holes, again, you'll never be able to see this because crappy cameras, but you can't get one does not go into the other without the other one moving. Okay, so they're not in the same place. Unfortunately, the hole, the way it was done with the shrinker, the hole is moving this part away from the pivot point. Okay, so the error here is sort of in the wrong direction. Now we can fix that. Right? And this is what my temporary fix is going to be, which is total nonsense, but it will work. I'm just going to flip the part. Like, it puts the set screw on the back side, but it'll make it usable for a minute uh, while I work this out. I'm going to grab the right one here. You can tell which one's which just by the wear marks. So if we now put them together, it's still not good but it's better. Okay, so we're gonna flip it around because that gets us about a 32nd of an inch back. We actually should be adding some material to this pivot here. It's really, nothing's ever gonna fix this except for having more material added. So if you've watched the channel, you know I have enough welders to do this and the experience to do this kind of buildup. But this part is hardened. Okay, so this is hardened steel. I don't have a hard surfacing or some other kind of rod in the shop right now. It's almost not even worth going out and uh, and worrying about this kind of stuff. Um, again, it's rolling across the surface. How much pressure is it seeing? Well, I can calculate it out a uh, fair bit. So I just don't want it to mush and turn into nonsense. That needs to be hardened. So we're not going to worry about any of this for now. I'm going to flip this around. I'm going to throw these back together. I'm going to put the original jaws back in. I'm not going to use the fancy jaws on this set. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to purchase a set that actually is correct. Like the original ones, the Lancaster ones, not these knockoff things. At this point, the amount of time that I have invested in figuring out why this garbage doesn't work would be the equivalent of buying about two or three of those Lancaster things. Uh, at this point, again, we're going to, not going to toss these out. I can fix them up, maybe donate them to some kid. Uh, that's looking to start a little metal shaping, whatever. We'll find a good home for them, but we will rehome them. I don't want them in my shop anymore. All right, so now that I've got it back together, I'm just gonna quickly show you, everything's working a lot better. So as I'm coming down on the lever here, just, just flipping this part around has taken up enough of the slack so it starts to move long time before it used to move. Like it, it was always kind of halfway down before it even moved. Now you don't get engagement until near the bottom here, but it's still working pretty well. <clears throat> so here's some 
I'll throw the handle in and just All right, that's a million times better than this thing's ever worked. And it's all just a matter of getting those parts put in. If you're gonna keep your shrinkers and stretchers, maybe have a look and make sure that all of this stuff is working properly. Uh, and then you can get that kind of performance out of them. Again, I'm pretty happy with that. I keep saying I'm gonna buy new ones, who knows? That's working pretty well for me. This is what I've learned. Um, they can't be crudely made or they won't work properly. These are most definitely crudely made. And with that, thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode.